thank you very much uh, to everyone, wherever you are in the world, for joining us today for the latest talk in Haymarket's online events program, The New Authoritarians and COVID-19. My name is Duncan Thomas, and I'm the European representative for Haymarket Book, the organizer of this event alongside our co-sponsors, Pluto Press. Mm -hmm. Uh, before saying a little more about our upcoming discussion and introducing the speakers, I just want to go through some brief housekeeping. With many people watching the stream, uh, your video and audio may occasionally become choppy and you can help smooth things out by reducing your video quality. To do so, just click on the settings cog on the YouTube viewer and set your video quality to 144p iOS user, uh, viewers can reach the same option by just tapping the three dots in your video player. Secondly, uh, after David and Sita have had their discussion, we'll take some questions from viewers. And if there's something that you would like to ask or contribute, please just write in the comment stream on YouTube and we'll feed as many of those as we can through to our speakers, who are, of course, as I've said, David Renton and Sita Balani. David Renton is a barrister, writer, and political activist based in London. He's the author of many books. Most pertinent to this discussion is The New Authoritarians, Convergence on the Right, published in 2019 by Haymarket Books in North America and Pluto Press in the UK and Europe. David's book offers an original and compelling analysis of how newly emboldened and radicalizing rights has come to global political ascendance culminating in the victories of Trump and Brexit and represented by a growing cast of unsavory characters across the globe. The New Authoritarians shows how these political formations draw on a number of right-wing tendencies, sitting in an uneven space between traditional conservatism and fascism. Perhaps unsurprisingly, many of the countries currently governed by such regimes from the US and UK to India, Brazil and many more have been hardest hit by the virus to date. If this discussion interests you, you may wish to buy a copy of The New Authoritarians, and you can do so direct from the Haymarket or Pluto websites through links that you can find below. Joining David is Sita Balani, a lecturer, writer, and activist based in the UK. Her work has appeared in numerous outlets, including Boundless, Feminist Review, Novara Media, Open Democracy, The Verso Blog, and Vice. She is also a co-author of Empire's Endgame, forthcoming from Pluto Press. Finally, just before kicking off uh, a little about the organized event, Haymarket Books is a radical, independent, non-profit book publisher uh, based in Chicago. Our mission is to publish books that contribute to struggles for social and economic justice, with our authors including Naomi Klein, Angela Davis, Kiangi Yamata Taylor, and many others. We strive to make our books a vibrant and organic part of the social movements and the education and development of a critical, engaged, international left. Pluto Press is also a radical publishing house who have made invaluable contributions to every field you can imagine since their foundation in 1969. The ideas that Haymarket and Pluto try to promote are essential to building a better world and are never more important than in times such as these. If you're able to, please consider supporting Haymarket by donating to our website or through Venmo, subscribing to our book club, buying books, our books online through our website or following us on social media, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, where this talk will be available for viewing after the event, alongside the rest of the discussions in our teaching series. You can support Pluto Press by signing up for their Patreon and newsletter, or browsing their website, where they're currently running a 50% sale on books by their BAME authors. Without further ado, I'll hand over to our two speakers. Thank you once again for joining us, and I'll see you in a little while for our Q&A. First, I'll pass to David Renton to kick things off, and then he and Sita will move to a more informal discussion. So, over to you, David. Thanks so much, Duncan. Um, we wanted to begin with two stories, one from the United States, one from Britain. Um, I mean, the news in Minneapolis of the killing of George Floyd and the news in Britain of the scandal concerning Dominic Cummings. Now, it seems to me that when George Floyd was killed four days ago, any ordinary human being with any shred of decency would have simply stopped whatever it is they were doing, because the images of his death were shocking. Here was a man 46 years old, a father, a trucker 
a security guard. Police officers placed their knees upon his throat. They could hear him say, I can't breathe. He stopped moving and still they left their knees there. But when the news came out of George Floyd's death, Donald Trump didn't stop, did he? Trump always goes to Twitter. It's his home, his own private safe space. It's where he goes to urge on his followers, the anti-vaxxers, the white supremacists. And it's where they go when they feel small to take strength from him. George Floyd's family called his death murder. Crowds took to the streets demanding that the four police officers who killed him were put on trial for murder. And I'm sure everyone viewing will have seen Trump's tweet in response. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. Isn't that the very essence of the moment we're living in? We have the most powerful politician in the world. And when he sees a crowd of people with assault weapons and a very old slogan on their placards, work makes you free, then Trump tweets, liberate Minnesota, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia. But if he sees a different crowd and their banner says justice for George Floyd, then all Trump's instincts are to call the National Guard on them. Now, when I wrote The New Authoritarians, what I wanted to do was to warn people that the threats of violence we all heard when Trump was elected, those weren't just threats. I wanted my readers to have a language so they could explain how similar things were happening in countries as different as Brazil and France, India and Britain. But to say that the processes are similar doesn't mean that they're exactly the same. Maybe we're all heading in the same direction, but we're going there by different routes and at different speeds. So with that in mind, I want to pass over to Sita and perhaps you could explain who Dominic Cummings is and what the scandal here tells us about COVID and the people running Britain. Thanks, David, and thanks to Haymarket and to Pluto for the invitation. Uh, I'll jump right into Dominic Cummings and what he reveals about authoritarian Britain, but I imagine we'll circle back around to the States and what's going on uh, in Minneapolis over the course of the discussion. So Dominic Cummings is Boris Johnson's chief of staff and has recently been in the news for flouting the lockdown rules. And the specifics of that story have been rehashed endlessly in the UK, so I won't go over them again, and they're probably to dull to an international audience with. But I think what's interesting here is that Dominic, Dominic Cummings' has drive to his parents' house and his kind of bizarre visit to a car school um, has ignited public fury in a way that having the highest rate of death in the world, of excess death in the world, um, during this time has not yet caused kind of serious, sustained outrage. So I think that in and of itself is a kind of notable and worrying sign, one that might uh, show something disturbed and disturbing in the national collective public life. But to think uh, a bit more about Dominic Cummings' political projects might help us understand that, I think. So he's an unelected figure. He has this kind of Svengali-like role. Um, in many ways, he's much more powerful than many elected officials. We might well think about him as a kind of Steve Bannon figure. Um, but I think it's important to not fall into the trap of seeing him as a kind of evil genius, because that's sort of his own self-conception of himself as a kind of like maverick genius figure. In fact, he's just a very effective opportunist. So we might want to think of him uh, in that light. So he's been credited as being the brains behind the Leave vote with the slogan, take back control and later get Brexit done, which of course... Uh, was Johnson's slogan in the election at the end of last year. And Brexit has, of course, been the vehicle around which uh, a British authoritarianism has been organised, I think, quite successfully. Uh, and part of the reason it's been so successful is that it's managed to pull together the idea of freedom and sovereignty with some long-standing racial resentment, particularly towards Muslims, towards um, black youth and towards immigrants. So Cummings himself is highly invested in tech and data. He's taken a lot of his ideas from Silicon Valley. I think there's a kind of habitual sense of Silicon Valley as somewhere that is at least Democrat voting. But I think it's important to note that there's a kind of macho, juvenile, very unaccountable culture there um, that offers a lot of scope for someone like Dominic Cummings. So there's this investment in disruption, in a kind of accelerationism that Cummings has really alighted upon. Um, and I think we can see the effects of this in something like the UK's over-reliance on modelling 
in its response to COVID-19, rather than the more tried and tested public health approaches taken elsewhere. So this focus on sort of mathematical models over um, other forms of scientific inquiry. Cummings attended SAGE meetings, so SAGE are the Medical Scientific Advisory Group, which is pretty unusual and I think somewhat uh, suspect. Cummings is also aggressively anti-intellectual, which is of course the usual mode of these authoritarian regimes. He hates the civil service, he hates humanities graduates. I don't think he's yet made any explicit mention of a kind of anti-Semitic trope of cultural Marxism, but he's only ever really a hair's breadth away, I would say. Um, he's cynical about uh, democratic norms. So his prints were all over uh, Boris Johnson's decision to prorogue Parliament last year. Um, and Dominic Cummings has documented his social, intellectual, political attachments on his very lengthy blog. So it's all there. You can go and see it in black and white. Um, and his ideas, I think, very consistently have a sort of strong social Darwinist bent. I think that's important because I think we might want to think about, often the question is, uh, what's the relationship between capitalism and fascism? Like, how do we understand them together? How do we understand what kinds of fascism might emerge from different moments of capitalist crisis? And I think social Darwinism is something that we might see as a kind of connective tissue between those uh, intellectual political projects. Um, so while capitalism might see social Darwinism in kind of individual terms, fascism looks at that at the level of the group. <clears throat> um, I'm sure David will have some things to say about that. And so Dominic Cummings also has a kind of pretty eugenicist set of ideas about the world. He's on record as saying that a child's performance has more to do with genetic makeup than patient. So we can see the kind of figure we're dealing with. But I think in the context of coronavirus, this idea of the survival of the fittest has taken on a uh, kind of painfully, violently explicit, literal um, meaning in front of our eyes. So Britain's got the highest rate of excess deaths during this pandemic of anywhere in the world. Black and brown people have been seriously overrepresented among the dead and the sick. Coronavirus, coronavirus has been allowed to run rampant in nursing homes. There's been almost no testing or PPE there for many weeks. And the UK's long-term strategy, if we could call it that, appears to be about shielding vulnerable populations. And what that means in practice is keeping sick or disabled or elderly people behind closed doors, away from the social world for what's going to be months, if not a year, which is an idea that I think has some fairly serious sort of eugenicist impact. So Dominic Cummings has been a kind of key architect of some of these um, ideas. And so while the sort of specifics of him flouting the lockdown have been the focus. I think it's good to look at his projects more generally. But to move on from Dominic Cummings, um, you've argued that the growing right is somewhere between conservatism uh, and fascism in a way. So more extreme than sort of traditional conservatism, but perhaps not yet uh, fascism. I wondered how well, to what degree you think that holds now under this crisis, during this crisis? Thanks, Sita. Um, I, I suppose the place to, to start off with is that when I was writing the book, what I really wanted to get away from was an idea that it was just, you know, the new right that we're under is simply fascist. Um, I totally understand people who see that and understand where they're coming from. But for me, fascism is a term that's got some pretty distinct meanings. It's about a style of organising, it's about a use of political violence. It's about a willingness to smash the existing liberal state and to put your opponents in jail as fast as you possibly can. Now, there's no way if you talk about um, the, the figures who were coming to the fore three or four years ago, the Farages, the um, Trumps, that, that's not their project. That's not how Trump has governed. There's been much more continuity than that. So I wanted to get away from the idea that Trump, Modi, Bolsonaro, etc., were successors to Mussolini or Hitler. But I also wanted to leave on the table the idea that there's something about this period that we're living in, which is causing politics re repeatedly to radicalise further to the right, and is even causing them as individuals to radicalise further to the right. So kind of since the book was written, which is a year ago, there have been at least two steps. I'll come on to the coronavirus in a second, but one even before then. Is I think we started to see at the start of this year in India something that was going further than the politics I was talking about in the book, and that's 
It was, a, it was a cycle which began with the Citizenship Amendment Bill, which for people don't, who don't know, was um, a piece of legislation which is intended to enable um, the, um, the Hindu BJP government essentially to disenfranchise um, um, India's large Muslim minority. Um, this, this caused enormous protests um, involving hundreds of thousands of people um, strikes, um, protests by women's organisations, a scale of protests we hadn't seen in India for many years. The state's response to that was to up the ante, was to engage in individual um, murderous attacks against Muslims, particularly in Delhi, where there was a pogrom which saw 53 people killed. And there were also attacks on universities and on the left. Now, one of the reasons why the BJP has been going further than some of these other parties, some of which, of course, have extremely aggressive and violent language. But the reasons why it was able to go further is because it's retained a party structure, which is much more like the fascist parties of the 1930s. Um, it, it retains, uh, has retained for decades, a private um, paramilitary structure, which organises people um, with um, uniforms and in, in paramilitary marches. Um, it has within it a sort of core organisation, the RSS, which is tough, it's ideological, and it sees itself as having the goal to sort of worm it within and to take over and capture uh, the entire Indian state in a way that you know ha hasn't happened in France or Italy or Britain or Brazil or anywhere else. Um, and of course, the BJP has a history of using the same sort of violence. It hadn't in its first few years in office, but now from this year it started to. The other thing I want to talk about, of course, was Trump, and I've already alluded to it, is, is, this, is this way in which he's turned during the lockdown towards um, private militia and has tried to use them to achieve the political end of, of bringing a premature end to the lockdown. Now, as ever with Trump, it's kind of strange. I'm sure that he, in his own mind, this is politics or business as usual. He's someone who, much like a normal right-wing politician, um, watches, maybe in Trump's case, fixates on the Dow Jones, the Nasdaq. He watches them daily. He uses them as an indicator of whether his government is doing well. It's doing well. It's doing well for business. Um, he's calling on the likes of Alex Jones. He's turning those sorts of figures into his own private foot soldiers. But in his head, I don't doubt that he's doing things which an ordinary, responsible, pro-business president would do. He's just getting the economy going however he can. And yet I'm also sure that for anyone viewing this from the States, there's been something truly shocking about this armed coalition of people, nostalgists for fascism, racists, um, gun enthusiasts, how they've been able to organise, how they've confronted health workers, how they've taken on the institutions of local state government. It, it seems from this distance that the right has been, as it were, pre-enacting the steps you'd see in a coup. That's what a coup would look like. And of course, that question, are those guns for real or, or are they just for show, isn't a new one. It's one which, which all sorts of people in Europe had to ask themselves in 1918, 1919 and in 1932 to three. So in a sense, this goes back to one of the arguments I was trying to put in my book, which is that the present politics isn't stable. The right has two paths ahead of it. Um, one that would return to conservatism. Now, that wouldn't be a generous normality. It isn't a normality that many of the listeners to this, this, um, this show would be interested in. It would still have border walls and racist police, but it would fall short of calling out armed mobs to harass your opponents. Or there's also an even more violent and more destructive future, and that's still very much possible. So now a question for CETA. In general terms, where does Britain fit in under the virus on this spectrum from conservatism to authoritarianism? Thanks, David. I think that's a tricky one. In the first few weeks of uh, the crisis, well, that's not quite true. As uh, coronavirus was taking hold across Europe, so the death toll was rising in Spain and Italy and countries around the world were beginning to announce lockdowns. But the UK government's response at that moment was just to advise people to wash their hands. And at that moment, I remember speaking to a friend and us joking that we had authoritarianism envy. So that we were living in the wrong kind of an authoritarian state and we would have been better off elsewhere, we'd have been better off in China because they had a form of authoritarianism that could at least handle the crisis, right? And so, of course, this is a kind of familiar idea, right, of Stuart Hall's policing the crisis. It's about 
this desire. I just didn't expect that desire to appear in myself after many years of doing that work, writing about it and organising against this use of crisis. But I think that kind of disturbing personal moment, I don't think I was the only person um, having that feeling, contains a sort of a couple of truths that are worth pausing on. The first is the scale of this crisis and what that might do to our um, political imagination. But the other thing is that it does feel at the moment that authoritarianism might be the only game in town. And in this pandemic, which is a genuine article emergency, you can see something that seems like in theory it might be a gift to a sort of authoritarian strongman looking to extend, extend or consolidate a regime. And I mean... The most obvious authoritarian play here is the use of an emergency, whether one that's real or uh, fabricated, as a pretext for amassing power, for steamrolling democratic norms, for implementing surveillance, for imprisoning political enemies, for blaming racial others. Like That would be the authoritarian playbook if we were to write it in advance. And I think Viktor Orban in Hungary has been working most obviously from this playbook, right? So we've seen him... Um, now allowed to rule by decree, there's no expiry clause on that, and part of the coronavirus legislation has included jail terms of up to five years for anyone intentionally spreading misinformation that hinders the government response to the pandemic. So that really opens the door for all kinds of uh, political harassment, political censorship, uh, and just serious crackdown on opposition. And I think Modi's been playing from this, this playbook uh, to some degree as well, right? So we've seen real serious attempts to um, use the crisis as an opportunity to arrest those who were involved in the protests against the CAA and the NRC. We've seen lots of the women who were there at Shaheen Bag be harassed and arrested under the, during this time. But Johnsonism, I think, is quite a different beast. And it's a project that seems quite incoherent. At first glance, it looks like a combination between, I don't know, Brexit and a naked will to power. But it's, it's very hard to see what the kind of... Um, where it might fall on that spectrum. Because if conservatism of all stripes is in the end a defence of inequality, one of the questions is what is that defence? So Thatcherism rationalises inequality through meritocracy, right? So there's inequality, but it's justified. But Johnsonism is more capricious, I think. It doesn't offer the aspiration, it doesn't offer the individual success that Thatcherism offered. It's not It's not an aspiration story. It's much more of a kind of bullish defence of white entitlement, I think. So I think one of the things we can say about that is that what we're seeing here is the effects, the long after effects of a kind of British or perhaps more accurately English exceptionalism. So Britain won the 19th century game of competitive colonialism and we might see the way that that's continued to deform the national political culture along the lines of the delusions of grandeur that produce a sort of hubris actually that allowed for Britain to think it just can't come here, it just won't happen here, we'll just take it on the chin. And I think, I mean, this seems like a kind of flimsy um, reason for these political decisions, but I think if you look uh, at the US, uh, the neo-colonial superpower displaying a very similar delusion of grandeur, a similar sense of itself as infallible and exceptional, the way that imperialism has a kind of deforming effect on the psyches of the supposed victors. And, um, you know, this is a, an observation that M.A. Césaire really made back in 1950 when he wrote Discourse on Colonialism, and he said that the reason Nazism shocked was that it applied colonial logic back in the heart of Europe. I saw a tweet a couple of days ago that sort of said a version of this, and he said, well, someone said, now Britain knows what it's like to live under British rule. I think we might think of that as the project of Johnsonism. So I don't know exactly where it would fall on that spectrum, but that might be a different way to understand its logic as a kind of continuation uh, of the colonial projects come back in some way. So David, what do you make then of these divergences between these seemingly aligned Thanks, Sita. Look, I mean, I think the, the, the one big point I, w I really want, want for you to get over from this is that if you're going to talk about the new right as a totality, if you're going to say this is a phenomenon which is happening in America, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, it's happening all over Latin America and in the Middle East and the many other places beside that. If you're going to see it as a totality, 
you can't just reduce it to Johnson and um, Trump. It's almost a mistake to see them as the typical form of authoritarianism in this period. And, and I'm seeing you, you've already been alluding to some of this, that um, the, the approach in um, Britain and the US is essentially an approach of denial. Um, Johnson um, agreed to the lockdown belatedly, um, resentfully and under enormous public pressure. So in that sense, he's very similar to Trump. Um, he's going the same direction, if not quite as far. And you can even talk about other people in the world who go even further. The obvious example is um, Brazil and Bolsonaro, where you've had Brazil and um, Bolsonaro has already um, removed two of his health secretaries because they actually supported social distancing. Um, clips of his cabinet meetings have been going um, viral and they've showed him swearing, demanding that judges are jailed and not exhibiting even the very least bit of sympathy for the tens of thousands of people who've died from the disease in that country. But there are other countries too. Um, Cita's talked about Hungary. It's very similar in Poland. Essentially, presidential governments have been perfectly happy to say, we believe in coronavirus, we're announcing quarantines. And in lots of ways, this is actually a much cleverer way for people with that sort of politics to play this game. Um, Cita's referred to India. If you go there, the BJP actively welcomed and introduced a lockdown. It strengthened the position of Prime Minister Modi. It was wonderful for Modi because in the days beforehand, um, India had seen these huge protests and suddenly all the protests had to stop. Um, the, the, the regime there has been able to spread its lies about how uh, coronavirus is a Muslim condition somehow without anyone else having really any opportunity to stop them. And in lots of ways, this has been a far more effective strategy for the far right. They can blame racial outliers for the disease while presenting themselves as the people who brought the nation through its moment of crisis. So, you know, if we see coronavirus as something that may well happen um, over several stages, then we should expect more and more people from an authoritarian type position to be saying this, to be, to be presenting themselves as, as it were, coronavirus believers and also as authoritarians, and the two things can fit together. Now, question for Sita, you know, we've only been talking about them. How about the left? Are there places, I don't know, Britain perhaps, or India or anywhere else, where we see a rising social movement that's capable of beating back this new aggressive right? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question, I guess. So, I, I mean, resistance was at a real high um, in India prior to this moment, as you just said. Uh, the protests were really inspiring, I think, and really a kind of beacon of what might have been possible in terms of a powerful, very widespread, um, very heterogeneous movement against authoritarianism. I think seeing the images of the women at Shaheen Berg all over the world may, gave a, a sense of possibility, um, particularly that, uh, that protest led by women, led by Muslim women. I think that was a moment of a real high and I really don't think um, <clears throat> we've seen the end of those protests. I don't think we've seen the end of that wave of resistance. So I don't think we should feel too um, despondent about that. I think it's fair to say that the parliamentary left uh, is pretty weak across the board. So the parliamentary left is kind of all over the place, is, has a terrible habit of fighting, fighting last year's battle or fighting the, the last election rather than one that's in. And and that Corbynism was roundly defeated by that at the end of last year, uh, much to our collective um, horror and disappointment. And in its place, we have Keir Starmer, the new leader of the opposition, um, who I, has very little cut through and who seems to please a particular section of the media to some small degree. But beyond that, um, he really seems to be the first of a very tepid fashion and not willing to take any of the opportunities uh, for the left that might arise here. He's been very weak in his support for the unions um, and has consistently seen himself as a quote unquote critical friend. And that seems to just be being a friend, as far as I can tell, uh, for most of his response so far. And of course, having Biden uh, leading Democrats into this next election, I don't think is a particularly appealing prospect. But outside, of course, of party politics, things do look a little bit different. Um, I think the protests, the riots that we're seeing in the States now are obviously a sign that things, uh, that other forms of protest, other forms of resistance are not going to go away. And so I think that 
the global support um, for for that uh, that resistance that's happening now is really something and something that we need to continue to push um, and also continue to make sure that other kinds of internationalism don't fall off the table, right? So we need to make sure that that kind of international solidarity goes much more widely um, than just the US. So of course, that's also a really important space for us to see ourselves in the struggle and to support that in active material ways. That solidarity fund um, and those people uh, contributing to that and encouraging others to do so also. Um, so I think that that could be a real game changer, but of course we don't exactly know how. Um, in the UK, I think the left is looking pretty weak, even outside of the Labour Party. Um, but two things I think really deserve a, a mention here. The first has been seeing actually just the absolutely incredible increase in trade union membership over the past um, few months. That's been really something to watch, in particular the way that independent unions, so the International Workers of the World, the International Workers of Great Britain, have really been at the absolute forefront of that. And they've been at that forefront for years and years now. Like I think if there has been, and I think there has been, a sort of reigniting of the trade union movement here, um, it has been because they have led it. And I think that's really important to see. I think looking at the way that the NEU, which I don't think is the union, the National Education Union, I don't think that's anyone would have picked for um, shy and rural militancy, but they really have done. And I think that though uh, Johnson's attempting to open the schools in a couple of days for some citizens, some some age groups, I my sense is that the number of people, the number of parents taking that up will not be very significant. So I think the unions are, there is kind of pushback there. And I think the mutual aid networks, though they have not necessarily have had the kind of consistent leftist character, what they have done is open up a set of possibilities and a set of actual, actually a set of infrastructures. But I think it's too early to say what direction they might go in. Um, so I wondered, David, where you saw the rest of this going i suppose so what do you think as the what do you think the next? i think we're seeing the lifting of the already quite loose lockdown here um what do you think that's going to bring with it and what where does that leave the right sure um well i mean one one thing i think we need to start with is is that there's a real possibility there's going to be a coronavirus second wave um this isn't a cheery prospect but it's just something we need to factor in as something that's a real likelihood. Um, e even if, um, e if, if you think about this, just how do, you, how do you cure a disease like coronavirus? We're all looking for a vaccine. Um, we, we have to be, we have to have a sense that the state that would deliver a vaccine to the people is a state which has been um, weakened ex to an extraordinary extent by decades of privatization in every country in the world, but certainly in Britain and the US. Um, you know, the first time in Britain that you had um, one of our um, senior politicians say, we're going to go off and order enough tests so everyone in Britain can be tested, you can date it. That began to be something which I was saying at press conferences as long ago as February the 8th. And three and a half months later, it still hasn't happened. So if you could imagine a world in which suddenly there was a vaccine and there were billions of people around the world who wanted that vaccine, don't think for a single second that means that within three months, four months, six months, everyone would have it. Not with the states that we've got that are incapable of buying masks or gowns, let alone anything else. Another reason why I think that not so much necessarily that there, that there's, there will be a second infection, but certainly that there's going to be an immense fear of a second infection, is you just need to be honest with yourself. What sort of condition in this is this? And it's a condition which many, many people suffer effectively as a lung infection. It's very close to the symptoms of flu. Now, if you look in the Northern Hemisphere, when did people die of the flu? And the answer is not um, in April or May. The answer is overwhelmingly in November and December. And that's why it seems to be pretty well inevitable that as we get into October and November, there's going to be this absolute terror um, from people and from large parts of our political um, establishment, the state, that we're going to see something like a second wave coming back in December and January. So we start to think about this as a disease which is going to be there either as the disease or even just the fear of the disease repeatedly throughout this year. I think one thing that we, we need to anticipate um, that, that's just very likely to happen 
is an immense fear of migrants as the carrier of a return of the disease. And, and that's, a, that's a, a story which, you know, the richest countries of the world have prepared themselves to believe for 50 years now. Um, the reality, of course, is that once the coronavirus um, happened, you know, some of the major spreaders, um, uh, you know, if you list where did the first infection happen in, in dozens of countries in the world, and there's people from Britain, from Italy, people um, from the richest countries who travel more were the spreaders of the disease. But at a certain point, there is an objective risk that the disease will spread back. Now, it's always been the far right's basic solution to the coronavirus. If only it could build the walls higher, if only we could close the borders, there will be no disease. That message didn't really cut in January or February. One of the main reasons it didn't cut was actually most people in Europe didn't or in America didn't really believe that coronavirus was going to be as bad as it actually was. And I think we just have to be realistic for the right. This could be a much, much more credible and urgent message um, in the autumn and winter of this year, and something which, which you know, um, our centrist politicians are going to resist, if they resist at all, only very weakly. The other thing I want to say, though, um, is really about how coronavirus fits in to the, to the kind of economic politics of the world that we've been living in through the last 10 years or so. Because, you know, if you look at the level of spending that's been done to stop the, the disease, Enormous sums of money have been spent, more than in 2008 and during the global banking crisis. There have been mortgage holidays to sustain the housing market in Britain. There have been, again, in Britain, there's been a furlough scheme that's all, all been about enabling businesses to keep going, even without having to, to pay their workers in a period where their operations have reduced effectively nothing. So last time around, when we had the banking crisis, that led relatively quickly to an argument that there needed to be austerity. And that was the most powerful argument for a, a, a neoliberal right in around 2008, 2010. Insofar as the, the authoritarians have support from groups of poor or working class or middle class people, it's because the centre is still blamed for what happened in 2008. Um, liberals, social democrats were the ones who bailed out the banks Austerity, um, which followed, became a major cause of the far right's growth. The new right's popular because it presented itself as an alternative to neoliberalism. It said, you know, you can still have welfare so long as we um, allocate welfare along racial lines. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that the authoritarian to the new right has governed differently from the neoliberals. Um, there's been far more continuity in that. I'm talking about how they presented themselves and how they were able to grow. And I, and I suppose I'm talking about that cycle of massive state spending followed by cuts being an opportunity for the most right wing people in politics. Now, undoubtedly, the, lo the lockdown will lead to significant state debts in future. And the question is going to be posed, who's going to pay? While the pandemic's still raging, um, certainly in Britain, the argument for cuts and closures has been relatively muted. You, you, you read the, the Economist, the Financial Times, the right wing journalists in the Times and the Telegraph, and their line is very much, oh, yeah, no, no, we, we get this. It's got to be different this time. We won't make the same mistakes as last time. But I think we should be clear, the further we get away from this first wave, um, the politics of it are going to shift. There'll be more and more complaints from the rich that it's unfair for them to lose money, that it's unfair for them to be made to pay their share, that they shouldn't have to, that they can opt out in the same way that already they've largely opted out of the tax system. There's going to be a huge political fight over who pays, and it's still going to be shaping our politics in five or ten years' time. Now, I want to, to turn now to see to a question for you. The people listening to this, they'll know perfectly well the reality of their own lives, and they'll also know how, real, how little that reality um, makes its way into mainstream coverage of coronavirus or of politics generally. Will that gap keep on widening? I mean, can it keep on widening? Or is there a point when reality just has to crush through? Thanks, David. Um, I think you're absolutely right, by the way, about the question of uh, austerity and its potential return and how that may well be one of the sort of shaping factors over the next few years. But that question about reality and propaganda, I think it's an interesting one. So I've been thinking a lot about this, about this divergence that we're experiencing between what's happening and what we know is happening and how that's represented. So 
the mainstream media here have largely collaborated in insulating the government from the consequences of their really horrific mismanagement. I mean, I think we've seen headlines here that would make a dictator blush. There's been this conflation of Johnson when he was um, unwell, when he was in hospital, of his body with the body politic. And I mean, that, though it's a kind of trite cliche uh, deployed in various contexts, is also something that comes straight out of the divine right of kings. And I mean, we're still in a country that has a monarchy. So I think it's worth pausing on the way that uh, the media treat Johnson as a kind of child prince of some kind. Um, he's really given a pass for all sorts of things. He lies all the time. He's very rarely pushed on anything. Um, he sort of blusters his way through things. If he can't bluster his way through, he hides, he disappears. During the election, he hid in a fridge on live television. He barely gives the press conferences and we get kind of any old Tory stuff shirt in front of the mic. So there's something about this divergence between what we're seeing and what we know is happening um, that I think is quite stark. And the question of whether or not reality will kind of burst through is a difficult one um, because, of course, we are living in an embodied social reality uh, all the time. And for those of us who have unfortunately lost someone and had to attend a funeral via live stream, the, the meaning of that has been really quite uh quite stuck um meanwhile we see these kind of astroturfed street parties for the e day a, a thing i've never really seen this country celebrate you know victory in europe day was always seen as a kind of small small issue because britain celebrated d day and had its own nationalist version of the same collective story um and so yeah we've managed to see what i think has been a kind of socially engineered ignorance being produced in front of us. It's not so often that you get to watch the process so closely. But now that we can't do anything except look at screens all day, you actually get to watch them socially produce this kind of second reality in front of you. Um, and I think the question of whether, whether and how we, a, a kind of uh, reckoning might be forced is one that I think remains really open. Um, and I think that the way that might happen will, of course, be um, unexpected. One can never predict these things entirely. But I do wonder if the return to schools might um, be one of the moments in which we see uh, that refusal. So I think lots and lots of parents refusing to send their kids in starts to build something very small. So um, I'm afraid I'm not super optimistic about this, but um, perhaps the questions will uh, lead us somewhere more optimistic. So I'll hand back to Duncan now. Thank you. Thanks a lot to both of you for that discussion. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in, so I'll just kind of put them to both of you and you can pick them up and um, we'll see how we move through them. Um, one question that came up in the chat, which you uh, touched on in a few contexts was that given this shift uh, towards the far right and the kind of recomposition that you're talking about is global. Um, a question was whether you could talk about um, whether or how this these forms of authoritarian populism are driven by different forces in the global north and the global south. Um, and I suppose even between, you know, between like the UK and the US, the process is very different. If we look at the Conservative Party or the Republican Party and, and Trump, um, so whether either of you could speak about the context that you're most familiar with um, and the specifics of the forces driving them and any generalised patterns that you can pull out. Shall I go first on this maybe and then see? Yeah. Um, look, look, first, I just want to make two points. And they're both very general. Um, I, I always try and think through the comparison with, um, with how this happened in the 1930s. Because in the 1930s, essentially, how the process worked, it started in two countries, well, one originally Italy, then Germany. You only had two centres. And those two centres were both, um, they both wanted to be colonial powers. So what happened was when it then spread to the poorer um, countries of the world, it was just a complete disaster. Um, all these various wannabe fascists in India and other countries in the world would meet Hitler and Mussolini and Hitler and Mussolini go, sorry, sorry, we're not interested in you. We're only interested in the British because they're already the people who are ruling. Actually, we're on the side of colonialism. We're not on the side of change. So you had this kind of a small number of centres and those centres overwhelmingly in the global north. 
Now, if you think about today, the first thing to say is there are many more centres. You know, Trump is a centre. He spreads. Um, people in Britain want to co want to copy Trump. He he retweets absolutely minor and trivial people um, in the British far right. And he does that for the far right in every different country. But, but he's not the only spreader. Um, Russia is a spreader. Um, Israel plays a role in terms of kind of um, kind of blue washing the um, anti-Semitic um, stuff coming out of countries such as Hungary. So you have multiple centres of the far right these days. And again, many of the centres from which the far right is spreading are actually not in Europe or the US. Um, Bolsonaro, but even before that, you know, what was the first time when we could see global politics really moving to the right after 2008, 2010? Well, it actually was in the Middle East and it was, was the rise of the dictators there. In lots of ways, this is coming from the second world or the third world in, in those old categories. Uh, and it's gone from there to the first world rather than the other way around. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful um, way to lay it out. And I, I think you're right that there are sort of multiple centres here and we have to take that seriously. I suppose one of the things that might connect them, um, which is again a very general thing, is to think about the global effects of neoliberalism um, as something that offers a lot and delivers very little. And I think that uh, that has been quite powerful all over the world, that the offer of neoliberalism in many ways was um, one that a lot of people found highly convincing, but the effects of it has been, the economics effects of it have not been, um, have not put food on the table, they've not improved people's lives. And again, we have that kind of disjuncture between experience and representation. And from there, there is obviously always fertile ground to offer something else. Um, and I think on a local level, I suppose, on a national level, what you can see here is that the defeat of anti-racist movements, whether by incorporation or through other means, meant that actually there wasn't really um, an effective, mobilised uh, anti-racist force to combat the ways in which, across the political spectrum, um, the use of migrants as a scapegoat had become just an everyday part of political collective life. So the left trying to do a kind of anti-immigration light meant that anti-immigration became the only game in town. And that really is very fertile ground for a project like, um, like by Nigel Farage, um, which has been really effective at mobilising that sentiment. So I think, uh, yeah, the kind of the long term economic effects of, of neoliberalism and then the absence of a real anti racist movement, a real anti racist left uh, in Britain is something we're seeing the effects of now. Great. Thank you, uh, both of you, for those, for those answers. Um, a lot to unpack there. Uh, but another question that we had was about um, some resistance to what's going on, which you also talked somewhat about uh, during the discussion. Um, and uh, the question was phrased as what a conversion of the left would or could or should look like, particularly coming out of this crisis. And the example that this person used was um, the, the carnival against uh, the, the anti-Nazi league and uh, the carnival against Nazis being uh, the anniversary recently. Um, and so what do you what kind of forms of resistance do you think uh, could emerge and uh, how might this look different in different national contexts? Thanks. So if you want to go first this time. Um, did I, need, I might need a minute to collect my thoughts. Okay, well, let, let me it? go first then, right. Um, two thoughts. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've written books about the Rock Against Racism and, and the carnivals in the 70s. One thing certainly we can learn from them is, is, the, is the idea that effective mass politics is cultural. You know, the, the, the far right has a base um, online in places like YouTube. It has people who it can draw on. And certainly the left needs to be um, doing the same sort of job um, as that. And that's something we did do in the 70s and people haven't been doing in the last 20 years. The, the other thing I want to say about convergence on the left is, that, is I think we have seen some examples of it. All the things which have taken off over the left on the last 10 years have, have been convergent in this sense. They've been coalitions between relatively centre left people and relatively far left people in which the relatively mainstream people have been willing to give a head to let the people run loose from the margins. So with Syriza, 
um, you know, Varoufakis wasn't a member of Syriza, but they, they invited him to run the economics for them. In terms of, say, Britain and Corbyn in its early heroic period, there was an enormous amount of drawing on the social movements, promoting people who weren't members of the Labour Party, listing to them and, and drawing from them. And that, to my mind, is exactly the model, even if obviously we know what happened with Corbyn in the end last year. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that we need to... From this context, we need to look with very clear eyes at the defeat of Corbynism, but without kind of rancor and without any sort of um, without any sense that we uh, that the project wasn't one that we should have committed to. Because I think it absolutely at that time in that moment was that, and there's still a lot to draw from it. I think you're right, David, that a lot of this does need to be won on the level of culture. But I I sort of disagree about whether or not we're already doing that. I actually think that one of the things that we're seeing here is the way that a lot of the kind of cultural politics of the far right globally is actually a kind of, um, it's a form of revenge for the fact that we've been winning on the level of culture for a really long time, right? So the biggest pop star in the UK at the moment, and for the last two years, has been Stormzy. And the ways in which the mainstream media respond to him have been really fascinating. They kind of verge between like really lauding him, Piers Morgan bigs him up every now and then, sort of strange situation he goes on the BBC he goes and meets school kids he's a kind of really genuinely heroic figure and you can't not smile when you see him on the TV right like he has this incredible cultural power and artists like Stormzy the whole kind of grind for Corbyn movement was incredibly powerful so I think one of the things that's interesting is that actually on the level of culture there's many ways in which we are winning the problem has been that we don't have political organization to back that up and what that means is that actually people end up um with in some ways the rhetoric of radical politics without the capacity to enact radical politics um so in a way i wonder if if our challenge is actually really just the the thing that we might be missing is the connection yeah. between the political and the organized and between the cultural and and the kind of on the ground politics and i think that might be one of the challenges great uh thank you both of you for that um Next question that I want to put to you um, picks up on what Sita uh, referred to as the continuation of the colonial project at home. I think the, the phrase that you referred to or the tweet that you referred to is like, now in Britain is the first time that we're experiencing what it's like to be under British rule. And so this person would like to ask whether you have any further thoughts on, uh, you know, how that project will manifest or um, those kind of historical processes. Thank you. Yeah. So I think one of the things that, that sometimes happens is we talk about the colonial project as though it was ancient history. Um, one of the reasons that's happened is because there wasn't any kind of reckoning with the reality of the colonial project here or decolonization, right? So the kind of unmourned loss of the empire is part of the reason, sort of endless, tedious nostalgia that we're met with in this country um, all the time. So I think the first thing we have to do is really deal with how recent the British Empire was, and of course there are still uh, colonial territories, right? So the Falklands were in the 80s kind of reminded everyone like, oh shit, we still have an empire. Um, but the other thing that's worth remembering is that that means that the personnel from the colonial project really aren't dead long if they are dead at all. So Dominic Cummings was obviously recently in the news and his wife, uh, editor of The Spectator, uh, truly the most vile media outlet um, in the country, I believe. I think that's like an official term. Um, her, so I don't know, Cummings' wife, her grandfather was a colonial governor. So I think just being kind of uh, conscious, cognizant of how recent that project was and how we live in its aftermath, not in a kind of rhetorical sense, but that we actually are continued, we continue to be governed by the families of the colonial project. And so I think just kind of reckoning with some of that might be important. So of course, the kind of um, the profit of uh, British anti-migrant racism is Enoch Powell. Enoch Powell is a colonial police officer, or a colonial administrator. Like, so I think one of the things that we have to do in order to defeat this, um, this authoritarian project that is, I think, a kind of colonial aftershock is to be serious and honest about um, the continued effects, the continued legacies of colonialism. And then actually, I think what we really have to do is have a very serious 
kind of educational projects, um, is in, in many ways a cultural project that explains to people what the empire was. And because I think then they'll make the connection for themselves, you know, I don't think we need to kind of belabor the point. I think that if there was a sort of serious understanding of empire in this country, then actually it would radicalize people in a very different direction than the way the right have used it. So that's my most hopeful take of the evening. Um, I hope that's helpful. The one thing I'd like to just add to that, if I can, is, is that I think we need to regain a tradition that anti-colonialism is a working a form of working class politics. Because often when people tell the history of colonialism, um, they talk about the main stuff. You know, they talk about Britain, they talk about the slave trade, they talk about whatever. We often fail to talk about what immediately happened before colonialism. You know, before Cromwell went to Ireland in 1649 to kill tens of thousands of people there, the last thing he did is he turned on the army which had been supporting them and shot any number of his former supporters because he knew that he had to break um, all sorts of resistance within the protest movement of the time in order to make colonialism possible. It, when, the, when the Scots went off and set up the Darien project and all the things they did as sort of co-partners in the English imperial expansion, the immediate thing which happened directly before it was the Highland clearances and the killings of thousands of ordinary Scottish people. And, it, you know, it's always been the case that whenever you've had um, a mass uprising in a colonial country against the colonial rulers, that's always then caused an echo within the working class or whatever within the within the colonial country, that people have seen the reality and the identity of those interests. So I think that's kind of one of the things we've lost. We've not not only have we forgotten that colonialism happened or that had a whole brutal history, we've kind of all, we've also forgotten that for colonialism even to be possible, you had to have something like a mini internal colonialism first to get the class relations going, to make that sort of cruelty something that could actually work. Thank you very much. Um, it seemed at times as though the kind of coronavirus um, episode has been a kind of accelerator uh, of some previously existing trends. And so, uh question I'd like to put to you both is that since since 2008, really, you know, economies have been on a kind of zombified life support um, and has really brought to the fore um, kind of diminishing options available to people trying to manage those states. No great kind of reorganization of capitalism in ways that uh, happened after previous crises. And... I suppose the question is around how you see the evolution between state state power, political power, and corporate power coming out of this. There were some narratives around the start of the crisis when uh, you know wages started being paid by the state, rent was suspended, and all these things that, that these were things that could be quite good to the left, and that always seemed a bit naive to me. Um, when we're surely going to see huge, hugely increased uh, rapidity of concentration capital within different sectors and those corporations becoming even more entwined with state managers. So that's kind of a big, a big question, I guess, but how would you see these evolving relationships affecting the kind of formations that you're talking about? Um, I guess I'll throw that out to either one of you to pick up on first. I'll say a couple of brief things. Um, I suppose one of the things that's been interesting is that we've seen how just totally dysfunctional kind of medium-sized businesses in huge parts of the world. So loads of businesses going out of going out of business almost immediately because it turns out they have like no reserves and no plan and their business model makes almost no sense. So that's been a sort of interesting thing to watch. Meanwhile, um, big tech businesses are doing incredibly well out of this already and they only stand to do better. So um Mackenzie Work's new book, recent book, I'm only halfway through, so I might have missed parts of it. Uh, but she suggests that the that this class is like digital capitalists, who she calls vectoralists, it's a great book, you should all read it, um, might be, we might need to look at them as, as a genuinely new kind of economic, form of economic organisation. Um, and she makes that argument in a very provocative way that I think some people have really pushed back on. But I think the point is a good one. Um, and so we might want to think about that's going to be a really that was already there and is being accelerated by this because actually owning the infrastructure through which logistics is organized means that you don't always even have to own the logistics infrastructure itself so you can in many ways 
own this much more amorphous thing that can make a huge amount of money. So Amazon in particular is obviously doing incredibly well out of this and is going to continue to do so. I think we're going to see some forms of state capture by these corporations that are going to go beyond what we've already seen. Um, I think you can see in, in Britain the kind of ecstasy of outsourcing that we've lived in for the last 20 years or so has really been quite striking during this crisis because there's almost nothing that this government can do on its own without outsourcing it to one of these three or four companies that it's been using for everything else for many years and which are complete disasters. So contact tracing brought to you by Circo, I mean, how's that going to go? Probably quite badly. And part of the reason for that is that the government can't function here at all without these companies. They have almost no capacity to run anything. And so I think what we're going to see is the increased power of those corporations and probably also, um, well, I guess, see some of them merging over the next few years. So I imagine Serco might not be Serco for long, but will join with one of these other sort of evil corporate beasts. So that would be my sense of where that acceleration is going in the direction of tech and security becoming an increasingly um, aligned sort of industry. Um, from me, I mean, I, I think I made the points earlier about debt and how that's going to be the politics next five or ten years. I, I don't really want to make those points again. Um, what I do want to say, though, is kind of in similar spirit to what I was saying before. Is it seems to me that there's a battle going on on both sides. It's not the case. It's not as simple as just um, the, the argument that coronavirus should lead to reforms. is just defeated and has no has no momentum to it. In some places it does. And I, I can only talk about this through things I know from my own day to day life. I'm a barrister. I represent people who are tenants who are threatened with losing their homes. There's an incredibly intense argument going on right now with with left wing lawyers and and you know, people involved in all sorts of renters unions and so on. There's, there's a mass movement behind this demand saying we should use the fact um, that, that what we've seen from coronavirus, that learning to make it much, much harder to get for, for landlords to get evictions in future. And that is an argument that's going on. And that's not just going to disappear, um, even if the government starts talking more about the lockdown. That's still a live argument. On the other side, though, again, talking about the courts, we have exactly what CETA was talking about. There's a process going on where the government's accelerating a program of, of closing. Um, the idea is to close 20, 50, 95 percent of all our physical courts and replace them with online courts. And then all the money that generates to hand that over to exactly the sorts of companies you mentioned. In our case, it isn't Serco, it's Atos, but but it's still one of the same three you were talking about. Um, and then those companies will, will hold a digital infrastructure as a mechanism of literally dismissing tens and thousands of people who work in the court system, starting with court staff, going on to the solicitors and going on to local advisors and so on. So it's like there's a, there's a battle going on on both sides. Um, there, there are opportunities to win certain things. But you're right, definitely, that, that it's accelerating for them the same way it's accelerating for us. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple of questions just about some of the uh, key terms that you're using and have used throughout this discussion. So uh, one question asks <clears throat> about your, your naming of the likes of Trump and Johnson as authoritarian uh, when they're democratically elected um, and aren't taking the kinds of, uh, well, the question asks, you know, when they're not using uh, the constitutions to give themselves you know, absolute power. Um, and a related question that we had uh, earlier on <clears throat> was about the relationship between authoritarianism and conservatism. Uh, so are all forms of conservatism authoritarian? Are some not? These kind of definitional, definitional questions. So um, maybe it makes sense to go to David first on those ones, given that a lot of your book dealt with this kind of, uh, this kind of issue. Sure. Yeah, with the term authoritarianism, what I was, I was looking for is a language which conveyed something which is, um, which is, in in terms of its um, attitude towards democracy, is away from conservatism, but not as far as fascism. So, for example, so one thing is again, if you just take Britain and America as two key examples, one thing you see um, again and again is um, arguments that because we because we the new rulers hold the executive. We're entitled to what we do, and the separation of powers no longer applies. You, you had that. That was the argument the Trump administration used when its um, Muslim travel ban was challenged through the courts. They said, 
Trump's the president. He can do whatever he's like. The courts has to bow to the to the president. We actually had the same argument here over Brexit. There was exactly this, the, the the ideology lined up in exactly the same way um, uh, over the the rapid pro, the prorogation of Parliament, um, the, the 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 justification for, for doing this, um, shutting down Parliament, admittedly for a relatively short period of time. The justification was we're the executive, we're entitled to do what we like, and you see the same sorts of things in terms of saying an election is is fair and it's it, and it's good if it if we win it. And if we don't win it, then actually we don't really have to play by those rules anymore. The attitude towards the state governors, again, is something that's different. Now, um, the second question within that was, is that different from ordinary conservatives? And how different or, or is conservatism always like this? And I think the shortest answer I can say is that um, conservatism gains an awful lot from a system in which it can present parliament and other institutions as these exemplars which have immense authority and everyone just has to obey them democracy is really really good for conservatism it makes it much much easier to rule and one one of the things that means is that um in conditions where you've got a booming economy um you've got growth in a way we haven't had in the world for 20 years um in general conservatism would much rather be um loudly um, expressly pro-democratic and maybe we will all say that's a facade but at least that's the way it talks under the kind of new more authoritarian conservatism um, we've had in the last 10 years there's been a shift a shift even compared to neoliberalism in terms of the um, in terms of the idea that actually you don't need to to big up democracy in the home parts of capitalism in, the, in quite the same extent that we used to um, yeah, I guess I'll just add a brief thing to that, which is that, of course, elections are the thing that get pointed to here, but the elections are a mechanism of democracy. They are not alone democracy. Um, and so I think what we're seeing here are some, the, the things that might help us to understand this as authoritarian might be something like the hostility to the judiciary. So we saw after the prorogation parliament that this kind of whole legal battle played out, um, I might think about something like the war on terror as something that acts as a kind of connective hinge between traditional conservatism and authoritarianism. So the early part of the war on terror was a conservative project uh, headed up by New Labour, in many ways the conservatives par excellence of the beginning of the 21st century, um, a kind of Thatcherite uh, project with sort of social um, kind of veneer of social equality of social justice. The early part of that war on terror project then morphs into things like the uh, things like prevent becoming mandatory. So the idea that one has to that all everyone who works for the state in some form or another um, has to consider many of their students or clients or service users as always suspicious, particularly if they are Muslim, right? And this is a a project that isn't entirely at home under what we might think of as a kind of normative liberal democracy, right? There's something questionable there that starts to push towards authoritarianism. And so one of the things that is, I think, useful is to try and see how a set of more extreme right wing tendencies become embedded in everyday life. So if in my everyday life as a lecturer, when I fill in a form about a student who I believe is at risk, for example, I think they're having a mental health crisis. If I'm filling in that form and there's a box, which there is, that says, do you think this student is at risk of being radicalised? That's very peculiar. This is a new uh, a new mechanism in everyday life that nudges us, that pushes us towards an author authoritarian mindset. So I think that if we look purely at uh, the election as the kind of perfect democratic norm, we're always going to miss things that don't fit into that model because they're smarter than that. I mean, they're not as smart as they like to think they are, but they're not so smart that they're going to start cancelling elections uh, anytime soon. So I think it's worth kind of remembering that. Thank you. Uh, next question goes back to a more um, historical terrain and um, this viewer asks about the interwar years in which uh, there were many traditionalists as opposed to fascists proper uh, who uh, grew and took power uh, in Eastern and Southern Europe and elsewhere. And there was a strong relationship between those and uh, Italian fascism and uh, fascism in Germany. And do we think that there is anything um, 
anything to learn uh, today about these convergences on the right and the way that they're evolving um, and the way that they relate to and reinforce other right-wing projects uh, that we can learn from that period. Should I go first on that? I mean, d definitely. I mean, it's actually the new writing project that I, I've been doing over the last six months since writing um, the New Authoritarians was, was to try and look back at the history of the 20s and 30s and try and think through whether they're things um, which I now see differently and which other historians see differently. I mean, just for example, it is a fact that the first time um, anyone published a book about the relationship between Hitler and Mussolini, um, um, first time a book like that was published was just a year ago. And it's pretty obvious that the reason why a book um, like that could be published is people were looking at the relationship between Trump, Trump and Brexit, Trump and his emulators in France and Italy and Brazil, and seeing how two different right-wing projects could spark off each other, could radicalise in a relationship with one another. And they could see that, that something about today has an echo of that, that in the past. Um, I suppose the only general point I'd make, and I don't want to say much more than this, is just what both the 30s and today teach us is that is that in order for, for, for to get that dynamic where, where the right can radicalise beyond um, conservatism, either to traditionalism, like the viewer asked, or to fascism, that process is, is vastly easier when you do have it taking place across borders, when you do have these two um, different forms or three or four or five different forms of, of far right movement interacting with one another, that makes it far, far easier. Um, we've always seen this as a series of national routes, but that's not how the process happens. It happens internationally and it happens in combination from different um, states moving in that sort of direction. Um, just one short thing to say on, on that issue of convergence. I think one of the things that we've really been able to track in the last few years is how those international convergences haven't necessarily happened around the issues that we might have expected. So, of course, we saw um, kind of global far right, quote unquote, counter jihad movement in the uh, 2000s and 2010s. But now we're just as likely to see a global far right converge around trans politics or abortion. I think tracking some of those um, in across Poland, the US, a lot of Latin America, Italy, there's this whole kind of strain of uh, anti-trans politics that in some places plugs in quite neatly into a sort of far right or authoritarian regime um, or movement. And in some places is more amorphous than that. And I think um, it's worth paying attention to those less prominent dynamics, too. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to open it up now uh, to uh, whether either of you have a, any questions for one another based on how the discussion, discussion has gone or uh, perhaps any closing comments. Well, I mean, maybe just a question to Seated based literally on what, what you said just then. I mean, when, I, when I was hearing you talk just then, what I was thinking of was, um, I was wondering whether you'd agree with this, um, it seems to me that in terms of the relationship between Trump, Johnson, or certainly between Trump and Bolsonaro around COVID and this denialism, it seemed to me that the immediate precursor to that was the same attitude towards um, um, climate change, um, global warming and so on. It was almost like the way in which they were sparking off each other around that mm -hmm. um, then becomes the mechanism which then caused them to have the confidence to spark off each other and both become COVID denialists. But again, that, I mean, that's just me thinking aloud here. I don't know if that's something that you'd you'd agree with. Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that climate change was uh, treated, in some ways it was a forerunner to things that we might now think of as the cult new culture wars, right? So everything becomes a part of the culture wars and they try and move everything onto that terrain as quickly as possible, even things that don't quite fit. So it doesn't actually make so much sense to think of coronavirus through this model of the culture wars um but it's actually the only thing they're very good at it's the only thing they're very um practiced at so they try and move everything onto that territory and i think that that's kind of what happened there right is that they'd culturalized climate change so it had become a question of belief come a question of um of culture a question of belief and i think that a question of ideology in a way that i don't that counter some other uh, things that they might do and I think that the way that they've done that with corona, coronavirus has been to use those familiar ideas of freedom and 
personal sovereignty, um, but they've done so along the lines that they are practiced that because of those culture wars. So I think climate change is one of the things that prepares them, but also some of these other things that they're very uh, upset about, things like safe spaces, you know? I think they, in some ways, are using the same mechanisms. Like, you can't control me. You, the coronavirus, don't exist. You can't. This is a very odd way to respond to a virus that very much exists. But I think it's because they're playing out of that other playbook. Um, if I could ask a quick uh, question to, to David, which is very general, but I wonder what you, as a barrister, thought of the role of the law in terms of the left's response to some of these things. So there are, of course, challenges um, in the legal system about PPE for doctors and nurses, for example. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts um, on how the law might be or not be of use to us in the coming months and years around these issues. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I just think that um, a useful way of thinking about the law, or, or two points. First point is, I think a useful way to think about the law is it's a mechanism by uh, under which you can have reformist struggle. You know, in some way, the Parliament's a mechanism through which you can have reform and struggle, the trade unions are. Um, in all of them, you get the same dynamic of representation to achieve some sort of objective that's interest of poor people, working class people, whoever. So in that sense, it, it belongs in a category, and it belongs in a category which actually isn't normally placed in. If you put it in that category, then you start to see a lot of things we used to on the left, you know, ideas about rank and file organising, controlling your officials and so on. I think they're very healthy approaches towards taking into the law. And I think that many people on the left, you know, the, the only time I've ever been um, in a courtroom and I've watched um, 50 people stand up and applaud a judge was during the Occupy movement when I briefly represented some of the people who were threatened with being kicked out of the building they were in. And, and their, their dominant politics were anarchist and they were really tough with their anarchism. But you put them in front of a nice judge and they melted and they literally clapped him out of the court when he gave them what they wanted. And there's no way that a tough trade union audience would have fallen for that in the same way. And I think that maybe goes to the second point, which is that there's something going on. Um, I sometimes talk about as juridification, that people are using the law in place of other forms of social struggle. And we're, we're over reliant on it. And as you said earlier, one of the things the right absolutely loves is posing as the people engaged in a culture war up against a bunch of experts, up against a bunch of rule makers. They're the rule breakers. This is a really positive dynamic for them. You know, you could even almost say that um, one of the things which contributed to Corbyn's defeat was in that final period of the election when he was perceived as a person who was on the same side as the judges and the same side as the experts and against the people. That was a real false step. But, it, but it, you know, he's not the only person who makes that full step. I think that it's something which um, a lot of people make. Even, for example, uh, I'll say this sort of wryly. You, you talked about the radical unions that we've had in Britain over the last 10 years. I, I love them. They're wonderful. You know, I have relationships with all of them and they're great. But, but they do use the law an awful lot. And I, I think that, that it's a kind of long term weakness that we drift into of overusing the law. Mm -hmm. rather than seeing social movements as the mechanism and maybe using the law very slightly at the end. The, the balance should be movements, 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 maybe a bit of law, and then back to the movements. Which I guess barristers don't tend to say. <laughs> well, you'd have a, a little more free time, maybe, David. Or maybe not, you'd be involved in the movements. Um, but uh, thank you to uh, David Renton and Sita Balani and to uh, everybody from around the world who's been watching this stream. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, if you found this discussion interesting, a reminder that you can get David's book, The New Authoritarians, uh, from haymarketbooks.org uh, and plutobooks.com, uh, depending on whether you're in North America or uh, Europe. Uh, if you've liked this event, you might also wish to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, to see what else we have coming up. Our next one is on Monday, June the 1st, a homemade poetry reading hosted by Aja Monet. Uh, I'd also encourage you, if you're interested, to subscribe to our book club and uh, browse our website to see what else we have uh, on offer and take a look at, at Pluto Books and their uh, mailing list and their current discounts. So thank you all again for joining. And see you next time.